Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. A few weeks ago, we looked at these funny four button controllers that came with the party quiz game. You can see how much fun they're having in their 1980 sweaters. And we found out that instead of using the digital inputs on the joystick ports, these guys acted like resistors. They used the pot inputs. Well, after thinking on this for a couple of weeks, there were still some questions rattling around in my mind, like why did they use a maximum resistance of 80K on each of these controllers? That seemed rather low. And I only remember there being four wires on the little junction box that connected all four of these controllers together, and that seemed like too many. It seemed like there would need to be at least five. So I couldn't stand it anymore. I had to look a little further into these guys, and that kind of ballooned into a whole other project that I didn't intend on, and I spent an awful lot of time on it. After thinking about this for a while, I decided I needed to try and eke out the answers to these questions. So join me as we go down the rabbit hole and find out just how paddle inputs on our old computers work. Here are just a few of the circuit boards I've had made recently by PCBWay, who is nice enough to sponsor this video. So whether you need a few boards or a lot of boards, check out PCBWay. So head on over to PCBWay and get your instant quote on standard circuit boards, flex circuit boards, assembly, and they now also offer rapid prototyping. So you can get your mechanical parts made as well. That's an awesome service. So for your next project, head on over to PCBWay. Our old computers were actually made with a type of analog input to support paddles. The Commodore 64 can use up to four paddles, two per joystick port, and made use of 470k potentiometers. The Atari 400 and 800 on the other hand were made with four joystick ports and they could support up to eight paddles. And they made use of a one meg ohm potentiometer. Typically a potentiometer would be wired up like this. One side of the pot goes to V plus and the other side to ground. As you sweep the knob on the pot, you'll get a voltage that is a potential difference ranging from V plus to ground that's proportional to the wiper's position. The paddle inputs on our old computers are wired a bit differently though. If we take a look at a wiring diagram for a paddle, we can see that they used a simple variable resistor, or a pot wired as a variable resistor. One end goes to V plus, and the wiper goes to the input device, which in the case of the Commodore 64 is the SID. This is an indication that these paddle inputs are not a typical analog input that measures voltage. At this point, I decided to treat the paddle input circuitry of the computer as a black box. In other words, pretend like I don't have schematics or any information about the inner workings. And all I can do is provide an input signal and measure the output. It seemed like a good place to start then was to provide a range of known input resistances into the computer and measure the output value. So I dug out my resistance decade box and a DB9 connector and soldered up a few wires and we have the setup that you see here. I pulled out my original Commodore 64 programmer's reference guide from when I was a kid and turned to the section on how to read paddles. Reading through this section reminded me that on the C64, the SID reads the paddles, and it only has two paddle inputs. So there is a 4066 analog switch chip that's used to select which set of paddles you want to read. Now on the Atari 400 and 800 on the other hand, they use the much more hokey pokey chip, but the pokey does have eight separate pot inputs so it doesn't use any analog switch chip tomfoolery. It just so happens that the control lines for that 4066 chip, which come from one of the CIAs, is also used for keyboard scanning. This means we need to use some machine code to turn off the interrupts so the keyboard scanning won't mess things up for us. Fortunately, there was a nice little machine code program included that had a basic loader as part of a basic program that makes things really easy for us. 
it takes care of configuring the 4066 chip to read each set of pots and stores the results where we can take a peek at them from BASIC. This was easy to modify for our investigative purposes. This program shows us all four paddle inputs and we can see from the jumping numbers that there is a bit of variation in the signal. I modified the program to take 100 readings of all four inputs and display the average and also keep track of the lowest and highest readings. This gives us an idea of how much variation from reading to reading there is. Now we're all set up to collect some data. And while this isn't the most exciting job in the world, it's absolutely vital that we do a good job. Our test setup includes a Commodore 64C, an Epix fast load cartridge, an SD to IEC with our software on here. This is a vintage Phoenix CPS 10 power supply, so we have a nice clean and stable power and our OMI 0.1% accuracy decade box. Now I showed the inside of this decade box as well as another in another video and there'll be a link to that in the description down below. I recorded the C64's output value every 10k starting at 10k on each of the pot inputs individually. Then I recorded the output value in a spreadsheet. Switched up 10k and took another reading. As you can tell, this is quite time consuming and quite boring. I recorded the C64's output value every 10K, starting at 10K and going to 370K and then an Excel spreadsheet. Then with all the data recorded, we can ask Excel to give us a scatter plot and then connect all the dots. Looking at this graph of the first SID tested, we can see that the response is not linear. In fact, this curvature we see here is an indication of how the paddle inputs actually work. You might be saying, hey Bert, what do you mean? How can we tell how they work just from this graph? Well, I'm glad you asked. Now, having a clue as to what was happening with the paddle inputs, I decided to connect a scope to the input. This lets us see any signal that our black box is imparting on our resistor. What we see here is a telltale sign of an RC circuit. How do we know? Well, we're connecting a resistance to the input and the curve shown here is a characteristic RC charge curve. RC stands for resistor capacitor. There must be a capacitor in our C64 that is charging through the resistor we have connected. We can see from the scope that the capacitor is allowed to charge for 250 microseconds and then it is being shorted out for 250 microseconds to discharge it and the cycle repeats again. This conversion process happens automatically and continuously. It is a built-in, continuously running function of the SID chip. You might have noticed this spike running through the scope screen. If we adjust the triggering level, we can get a good look at it. This is the result of the 4066 chip switching as the keyboard is scanned. Any readings the SID takes during this period are not accurate. If we look back at the testing program, we can see that not only were the interrupts turned off so there is no keyboard scanning, but a delay was put in to make sure that there is enough time for the SID to get a good reading. Inside the SID, we have an arrangement like this. We have a clock source connected to a counter that counts from 0 to 255 and then loops back around. And we have the input from our charging capacitor coming in here to a comparator. And the trip point of the comparator is set to about 2.2 volts with a voltage divider. When the voltage on the capacitor reaches the set point, the output of the comparator switches and that causes the value that's in the counter to be latched to the 8-bit output. This is the value that we're reading. Now, if the counter loops back around because the voltage never reached this point, it'll latch out 255. The entire charge and count cycle last 250 microseconds and then the capacitor shorted which I'm not showing here and after 250 microseconds this starts all over again. I've done all of this testing on an NTSC machine and I would expect that on a PAL machine since the clock speed is different we'll see a little different results but it should be very similar. By using the scope we can see the curve of the voltage versus time relationship of the capacitor charging. This explains the nonlinear output we saw on our first graph in Excel. The voltage rise on the capacitor is nonlinear, and since we are measuring the time it takes to reach a certain voltage, the output on our simple A to D converter will also be nonlinear. For the purpose of a paddle input, this is not an issue. 
your interactor will be moving something on the screen and will never notice a very slight inconsistency like this. I decided to see if the arm SID had the same response curve as the SID and was surprised by the very glitchy response. I contacted arm SID and found out this was a write timing issue with a few of the very, very early arm SIDs only when used on NTSC machines. Because the NTSC clock speed is a bit faster than PAL, which was the original development platform. They then changed to a slightly faster ARM CPU configuration, which took care of the problem. Coincidentally, they had been working on a new firmware version which did implement faster writes and asked if I'd want to give it a test. Of course, I said yes. The first beta firmware they sent was better, but still not quite there. Somehow, they managed to speed things up even more, and the second beta firmware they sent fixed the paddle reading issue for the early PCBs on NTSC machines. Thanks to Bo Mill from ARMSID for taking the time to figure out how to tweak the code to fix this issue. That is some great support. I characterized the ARMSID conversion and found it has a nice, very linear response, which is actually an improvement from the SID. For game playing, this will work just fine and you'll never notice the difference. For something like the four button controllers used on the party quiz game, this might make a difference though. I had originally thought there must not have been a lot of input devices that would depend on the characteristic SID pot input response curve but we'll touch on this a bit later. We know that the mixed analog and digital nature of the SID caused a lot of variations in areas such as filters, so it stands to reason that there could be a lot of variation with the paddle inputs as well. I dug out a few more C64s with SIDs and tested them too. Three of the four computers returned similar results. One was quite different. This could be a natural variation in SIDs, a bad SID, or it could be the result of some other component on the C64, such as the capacitors or the 4066 chip. I swapped the SID in the suspect machine, which was number three, into machine number two. Both computers were tested again, and both sets of results did not show the odd curve that the number three machine first did. This may have been caused by a bad connection, and pulling and reseeding the ICs fixed it. I suspect, though, that the issue was an error in my test procedure. Maybe I had the dials on the decade box in the wrong place, etc. Operator error is usually the first thing to suspect when you get strange results. Well now, with all of this data collected, we can get back to what started this whole adventure. These four button controllers for the party quiz game. Now I've got the program running up here so we can see all four controllers at once and you can see if I can press the buttons. Here's the number one button, number two, number three. We do get different readings and they're about 20 to 25 counts apart, which is enough to tell them apart using the original SID curve, if we expect that. So these will work on the Commodore 64 with an original SID. On the Atari though, this would be a different story because it is expecting one mega ohm pot, so there would only be about 10 counts between uh, each button, which is a lot harder to read with any accuracy. I puzzled over why they would have used such a low resistance if they were targeting the Commodore 64 and Atari, and then I remembered seeing this picture on the box. That is an Apple computer, and you know, Apple has always had to be different, and they built their paddle inputs to take 150k pots, which was even strange back in the day. So if Suncom wanted to build the same controllers to work on all three systems, they probably made a pretty good choice. Now, this is a case where the more linear response of the arm SID may cause a problem because it's up to 20 points off there in the middle of that curve, and which is about the same spacing on our buttons, so we may get some incorrect results. All of this testing and speculation got me wondering what other input devices back in the day may have used the paddle inputs in a non-traditional way. So I put the call out on various social media platforms to see what others had run into, and I got a lot of responses. Let's have a look at those. Of course, the things that are most like paddles are paddles themselves, and there were several different variations of paddles made over the years and even some analog joysticks, and all of these things would have been relatively curve insensitive as you're adjusting mentally for the position of something on the screen as you're moving the controller. There was even a dual analog joystick RC flight simulator that came with its own controller back in the day. 
and even something a little more modern like the Messiah uses external pots for controls, so the curve wouldn't matter as much for something like that either. Now the mice that were later made for Commodore 64s and things like the Atari CX80 trackball both had an analog mouse mode and a digital joystick mode that you could switch in between. And again, you're moving these things around while watching something on the screen, so the response curve of the SID is probably not as important. And there are some devices like the Atari CX85 keypad and the Cardco card key numeric keypad, which is a clone of the Atari, that use the pot Y input, but as a digital input. The joystick that came with the Commodore 64 game system, the Cheetah Annihilator, it used the pot X input as a digital input as well. So when used as a digital input, the response curve of the SID doesn't matter at all. And when we get into things like the Party Quiz game controllers, the Atari Video Touchpad, which technically wasn't for the C64, it was for the 2600, but in something like uh, the Muppet Learning Center that had a lot of different buttons that were mapped to different resistances, these things would have been more dependent upon that characteristic response curve of the SID analog input. There were a number of graphics tablets for the Commodore 64 back in the day, including the Koala Pad, the Suncom Animation Station, and the Atari Touch tablet, the CX-77. Now, I'm not sure on all these things, but it stands to reason that they may have been built with their output keeping in mind the characteristic curve of the SID or the Pokey input device. It would require some more testing to figure that out, though. And there were a few odd devices like this BodyLink Health Fitness System, the Atari Lab, and the Vasala Hall's Weather Station, which would have depended upon that characteristic curve of the paddle input on the SID so they could accurately input data. These were kind of odd devices. I don't know how many were sold. I happen to have this weather station, so maybe one day we'll break that out and try to get it working. And there were some programs that came with security dongles, which were really just a resistor or two in a box that you plugged into the joystick port and it would check for the right resistance. Given that it was looking for a certain value of resistance, that SID curve would have been very important. Well, this certainly morphed into a much larger and much different project than I originally had in mind. But to answer one of my first questions about the Suncom controller junction box, the output that goes to the C64, there are five connections in there, which is just enough to make it work. There's one for the five volts and one for all four controllers for the four pots. It was a lot of fun learning how the paddle inputs for the C64 work and the reason behind that characteristic response curve that you get from the SID's output. I also learned about a lot more devices than I ever imagined that used the pot inputs on the C64 and Atari. Some of them were used for strange purposes like data collection. And thanks to ARMSID for taking so much time to tweak the code to get the paddle inputs working for the very first board revs used on NTSC machines. That's really good support and I appreciate it. After studying all the data I got back from all the different SIDs, I created a way to map the output of the ARM SID so it's more like the original SID and I'll send that to the guys at ARM SID and see if that's something they can implement. I don't know if it's practical or not or if it's something they want to do, but it would be interesting to have that option when you're configuring your ARM SID. Let me know what you think. As always, I'd like to say thanks to the folks that help support the Hey Burt channel through Patreon and other means. It's greatly appreciated, and you really do keep this channel going. There's also an official Hey Burt t-shirt now, which was designed by my brother. I'll put the link in the description down below. If you have any questions or comments, well, I would love to hear from you. Just leave them in the comments section down below. And be sure to subscribe and like and tell all your friends and tell your mom and all that kind of stuff. Until next time, bye. A few weeks ago, we looked at these funny four-button controllers from... Oops, that's the back of the box.